So students, let's get officially started. It is noon. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Milo, for that countdown. The meeting is uh, the meeting. Our class is ready to get started. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today's class is all about founding documents, so the AP founding documents. That's advanced placement. Some of you may be in a course of advanced placement in government. You need to have these founding documents kind of set in your head so you're able to take the test in the next four weeks. And don't worry, you're gonna do great. But for the rest of us, these founding documents are extremely essential. And it's good for all of us to know it, not just the AP students. So we're gonna walk through nine AP founding documents. And I am so excited I am not alone in this venture that I am here with all of you and one of our top scholars from the Constitution Center, Nicholas Mosvick. Nicholas, are you excited about these founding documents? I'm always excited to talk about Federalist 10. Great, awesome. One of the nine oh, that we're we going to go. go through. So we're going to yes. go through these in order. Nicholas is going to give us a big overview, kind of the key players and the year. And then we'll dive into some of the big ideas that if you are going to take the test now or in the future, we'll be able to help you kind of connect the dots between our uh, structure of government, how it works, and the big ideas that we want to hold on to of values around the Declaration, the Constitution, and all these other founding documents. So Nicholas, let's begin um, with the Declaration of Independence. Give us a, like a big idea overview of what was going on and the, the keys of the document, the key ideas. Yeah, so uh, this is July 4th, 1776. So that's your, that's your date. Um, we are talking about the uh, mode by which the colonies declared their independence from England, right? So using this document, a declaration to do so. So it fundamentally does two things, right? It declares that independence and therefore the creation of a new nation. And then it gives the reasons for doing so, right? So I think those are, you know, those are the basics. And so what are the basic reasons? Right? So we, we have two sets of things. One, we kind of have the natural rights and the kind of higher flowing language at the beginning that we're most familiar with. And then we have the second part, which is the set of grievances, right? It's a list of grievances, right? Against the king specifically, because the notion here was the colonists have been begging the king to do something about all the bad acts of parliament for years and years, right? During the independence movement. And so now the king is being blamed for not protecting his subjects, the colonists, in their rights and liberties. And so that's why there's the list of grievances. So what is that natural rights language, that higher foot, uh, kind of that lewd language, as I say? Um, that's the preamble, right? The uh, unalienable or inalienable rights of the people themselves. So for one, the people are the authority. It's one of the you know, instances we have of that uh, popular sovereignty, but it also gives us that phrase, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuits of happiness, which by the way, as we'll see, when we get to the end of this session, we talk about Dr. King, he will invoke that same set of natural rights endowed by all, uh, to all people by their creator, right? That's the language of Jefferson. So there's that, right, the sense that all uh, men are created equal. They're endowed with these natural rights. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuits of happiness. And therefore, when those rights are not protected, they can declare their independence, right? That's the idea, that's the move, right? So there's rights, we can declare independence. By the way, here's a list of the reasons also why we can do so. Here's all the things the king didn't do to protect those basic freedoms and liberties we just asserted. So I think, think of the declaration of that way. One other thing to think about too is that the declaration doesn't come out of nowhere. Jefferson is consciously taking from other writers and other similar documents, mapping his own ideas onto them. Uh, but he looks at himself as the draftsman who puts together these existing ideas of liberty um, to create what we have in the declaration. Oh, that was perfect. Thank you so much. And then here's a follow-up question from um, Marino. Um, yep. Is there a difference between liberty and freedom in the context of the preamble? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question because we do use them interchangeably sometimes. I probably do. Um, uh, yeah, that's it's it's hard, right? Because the answer historically would be that liberty would have been seen different because they would have been talking about either kind of unfettered liberty, which is to say liberty in the state of nature, which is a philosophical concept, which is kind of the ability to do anything you want to uh, versus a kind of an idea of an ordered liberty of liberty within society. Um, so that's that has to do with uh, the rights of people as individuals um, to, to do certain actions or to not do so. Uh, so that liberty is kind of, we frequently see it as autonomy, the ability of individuals to make choices, but that doesn't necessarily entirely map onto the 18th century. Freedom is a related concept, but doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. That is, freedom, generally speaking, can be the recognition of persons, right, is humans, right? It's that sense of that is a human being people want to be free in the sense that they want to not have certain constraints upon them. So, right, it's, it. they're related, but they can also be separate in terms of how we think about constraints, how we think about action, how we think about how it relates to society overall. So I don't want to answer too long, but hopefully that helps. It's a very good it. question. So you're yeah, not, it's a great it's question. It's a smart question. Uh, it's so, yeah, and if we think of the liberty as a first steps of liberty within a system and freedom as contained by the individual, that yeah. might be a first step in diving deep into it. Um, next um, document, I forgot what we're doing today, um, the Articles <laughs> of Confederation. So give us a fr frame of reference. When did we have the Articles of Confederation? And then let's be really honest, why did they not work so well? Yeah, it doesn't last very long. You can see it's approved and then it takes four years to ratify. Uh, the biggest thing about those dates is it's during the Revolutionary War. So keep in mind that this means this is the national system of government during the war itself. And that system of government has pretty limited national powers, right? There's no really executive branch, there's no judicial branch. It's mostly just Congress that's making decisions. And Congress doesn't have a lot of really strong powers, even to do things like paying the army to tax the states to regulate the economy. Um, those pretty basic functions were limited because the states maintained much of their power under the articles. And as we like to talk, say often, it was basically impossible to amend them because it required all 13 states to agree. And that basically never happened. We got one amendment where 12 of 13 agreed to it and that still wasn't enough. So that does kind of lead us naturally to that next piece about the constitution because it very quickly the limitations of the articles become clear because for one states are doing things to each other and then they have their own problems because individual can't states can't deal with things like the war debt they can't make treaties with other nations by themselves but then congress doesn't have sufficient power to do with, deal with those things so even during the war there there's a lot of failures to do the basic things like paying troops and getting them supplies and so if you're George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, you've been in the army, you experienced this, you think there's a real big problem with the Articles of Confederation. There's a desperate need to, to have something more to create a true nation. Awesome. So I think that naturally leads us to the constitution. Absolutely, naturally leads us to the constitution. One real quick check-in from Riley, another great sure. question. Um, were there other people that claim that they had a, a lot of the writing that came, went into the Declaration of Independence? I mean, I always think about the fact that a lot of it feels cribbed from um, John Locke, but <laughs> like, w were there anybody else that would say like, oh, I write a big, I wrote a big chunk of that with yeah, Jefferson? I mean, Locke, uh, the Enlightenment generally, the Scottish Enlightenment in particular, there's a lot of schools of thought that are pretty influential on those ideas. Um, so Locke is a big name, but he's not the only one. Um, but it's also more that Jefferson has contemporaries, right? From Continental Congress, from smaller organizing committees and people from John Dickerson to John Adams to others who have been writing throughout the independence movement. And Jefferson is very clear that he admires these people and he's, he's taken from them. And then George Mason, his Virginia contemporary who wrote the Virginia Bill of Rights. Uh, Jefferson's also pretty forthright about taking some of Mason's ideas because he thinks they're good and that the declaration should reflect the broader ideas within 
the colonies, right, within this independence movement. It can't just be about Jefferson's pen. Uh, the other thing is there are, there are five members of the committee, right? So Jefferson is the draftsman, but then the other four, including John Adams um, and Benjamin Franklin, are editors. And one of the things we didn't mention that gets edited out is Jefferson has this language condemning the slave trade and condemning the king for keeping it going. And South Carolina, rather notably, informed the committee that they would appreciate it if they got rid of that language. So yes, there were very much edits made to Jefferson's draft as well. So it didn't all stay in there. Awesome. So let's do the, the Constitution and kind of what it spells out, what it's what's it written, and then um, and then I have follow-up questions on that. So we'll stay on the Constitution for a couple beats. Yeah, so um, I mean, the basics we have here is, uh, you know, keep in mind that this was done in secret, right? There was an Annapolis convention in, towards the end of 1786 in September where they agreed to have this May 1787 meeting in Philadelphia. Publicly, they were saying, we're just trying to amend the Articles of Confederation. But as we just talked about, that was a rather impossible task, right? And so in secret, what they were really doing is scrapping the articles and writing a brand new constitution. And, and people like James Madison came to the convention very much prepared to do that work, right? And so they had been thinking about this. And I mentioned when we talked about the Articles of Confederation, sort of the kind of things that were on the minds of what we call Federalist supporters of the Constitution, like George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison. What did they really want out of the Constitution? They want a stronger nation. They want a national government that has sort of what they think to be the basic powers of nation states, like treaty making, war making, uh, creating armies and supplying them, taxation, uh, regulation of the economy, right? Creation of debts, all those things. They thought that's what nations do. So the constitution has to do that. So it's about creating a stronger government in that sense. But they're writing one that's also of limited powers because we also talked about how the states were protected on their articles. The states don't wanna give away too much power either. Uh, so that's kind of the rundown of what they're trying to do with the constitution that I think is important for us to take away from here. And I know Curry's already mentioned the preamble but uh, you know, we, it's worth thinking about because we just talked about the declaration when we're trying to create these linkages between the documents, that language of the preamble and a popular sovereignty is one of those links. Because as we turn to the federal papers, we'll see that that's the running theme is that we, the people, the people themselves are the ultimate source of authority. And they, by ratifying the constitution in 1788, as we've got noted here, in fact, endowed it with power, right? Merely drafting and writing it and signing was not enough that people had to approve it. And that's why so many of these documents we're gonna go through in a second have everything to do with ratification because it was such a big deal um, yeah. trying to like test out the system and make sure it's what they wanted it to be. But before we jump from the constitution, one of, one of the things that the students when they take the exam have to do is clearly spell out not just um, the, the documents, but w each section, Article 1, 2, and 3, how mm. it spells out the role of the government in Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3, and then the interplay. So real quick, like a minute version, walk them through each branch of government, what the job is, what the function is, and then the interplay. Right. So we have Article 1, the legislative branch or legislative power, that's Congress. Remember, it's bicameral, so there's two houses. There's the House of Representatives, which was always democratically elected by the people, and then the Senate, which was originally elected by state legislators uh, before uh, the 17th Amendment changed that in 1913. Um, their power is to create and make laws. And uh, Article One lays out the powers that they have, the kind of laws that they can make. A lot of the things I just mentioned um, fall from that. They're talking about the powers that they're going to give Congress, right? Like declaring war, raising and supporting armies, um, regulating the economy, that's interstate commerce, the Commerce Clause, things like that. Article two, that's the executive branch. We also would call that the presidency. Uh, and so the executive power is lodged there. Executive power, generally speaking, means carrying out the laws, right? Or executing the laws. Um, there's a question within that, which has to do with the interplay between branches. 
of whether or not execution of the laws means merely carrying out the edicts or the demands of Congress, or if there is something interpreting that goes on by the president. Does the president get to define the laws that they are carrying out? Um, does the executive branch get to do so as well? Um, and that gets into things like administrative agencies, right? Under the executive branch, like say the SEC or something like that, or the EPA. And so when Congress gives them legislative power, that's interplay between the branches too. And then the third, that's Article Three, that's the judiciary. So that creates uh, the Supreme Court, but also gives Congress the power to create other federal courts. In other words, to create the federal court system as we have it, which is now district courts, courts of appeals in the Supreme Court. Um, it allows them to define the jurisdiction that is the cases that the Supreme Court can review and the other courts can review. But the Supreme Court also has uh, permanent, what we call original jurisdiction over certain cases like between states. Um, awesome. So that's there. And of course, the interplay there is that Congress and the president do things that then the Supreme Court has to review to see if they are constitutional, because that's part of their uh, designated powers under separation of powers and checks and balances is to check the other two branches when they exceed the constitution. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that rundown. Um, I think that was more like two minutes, but there's, I want yeah. to make sure that enough is in there. So, so all, the I rights. think that's great. That's all <laughs> in that structural constitution. Now yes. we go through, I always feel like the bill of rights might be out of place because I almost want to talk about the federalist papers before we talk I about agree. Okay, but, let's jump. We yeah, can do that. We're in charge. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's do, because <laughs> ratification is the story that leads to the Bill of Rights, right? The fact that ratification is so close that the Constitution is narrowly ratified by the states and that several states demand a Bill of Rights and that Madison ends up agreeing to push one in the first Congress, that's a product of this debate. So I think it yeah. makes sense to think of that totally. coming because subsequent, federalist right? Federalist people because, are are going around the anti-federalists are writing as well. There's a yep. huge hubbub and well, it's about and ratifying writing the first. constitution. That's the thing, right? Is that we have three people, three men who don't sign the constitution, George Mason, Alfred Gary, and Edmund men. Randolph. They publicly give their reasons for not signing. And that kind of sets off this ratification debate, right? The people have to approve this, but the anti-federalists, those who oppose ratification, they're making their case loudly right away. And so part of the reason for the Federalist Papers, which James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, they write most of them. John Jay writes a few. They're publishing these in New York, which is one of the biggest cities. They have control of most of the printing presses and newspapers. And they're essentially trying to convince, well, not only the country, but really New York <laughs> to ratify the Constitution because New York's really close. There are a lot of anti-Federalists. In fact, they have a majority in New York. So there's a lot of fear um, for Hamilton and Jay that even their own state won't ratify the Constitution. So they're trying to soothe the concerns of their countrymen. What are the concerns? The concern is, look, we need to replace the articles, but this takes too much power from the states and the people and gives them to the national government. They call it a consolidation, meaning there's too much power there, and that it isn't really popular sovereignty, but something else, that they're worried that this isn't really about the people themselves, but it's creating an aristocracy and not a republic the way they define it. So what is okay. Madison's response? I was going to say, let's cut, Madison, start taking through these. Yeah, so He's responding to that. Federalist 10 is responding by saying, okay, Madison says, I understand all that old theory that said you can't have a large republic built on popular sovereignty. I've studied it. I disagree. Why does Madison disagree? He says, in fact, larger republics are better at protecting liberty. They are better at republicanism because they naturally diffuse what he calls faction. When we say faction, we don't just mean political parties. That could be a form of faction, but we also just mean any set of interests or an interest group that is divorced from the common good, right? So he's saying, look, there are going to be factions. People aren't going to have their own self-interest. They're going to divide over them. The thing that happens in a large republic is it becomes hard to put coalitions together because there's all these different competing interest groups in a large country. 
Mm-hmm. And so Madison says that's actually a good thing because that's a natural barrier to the self-interest that happens with a lot of people, right? In other words, Madison's a bit of a cynic. And yeah, he's always he doubtful at, of man. <laughs> he's doubtful of human nature. And uh, his assessment is that we should take that into account when we write a constitution and create a structural structure for government, right? And so we need virtue amongst the people, but we cannot merely rely upon it. We need a structure that protects against bad behavior. Which leads us perfectly into (laughs) Federalist 51, which he says, this is the structure that will stop this inevitable bad behavior. Well done, Nick. Well, great transition. (laughs) And as he says in 51, right, rather famously, um, you know, if men were angels, we would need no government, but they're not, unfortunately is what Madison is saying. And so, yes, the answer is the structural constitution. It's checks and balances and separation of powers. And again, Madison is saying- Again, so when students are thinking about if they have to write an essay on this, they reference Federalist 51, talk about what the three branches do and how they check each other. So like Nick said earlier, like the Supreme Court can say Congress know that law is unconstitutional by interpretation you can then reference Federalist 51 and Madison's idea of this is how it works. So sorry, just connecting there, with that. Right, Curry, what Madison is saying is, I'm not telling you that the Supreme Court is gonna be filled with a bunch of demigods or individuals above everybody else. No, 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 they may well have self-interest, but their interest is a branch, mm. is in checking the other branches. And that's precisely the point, right? Is the president doesn't have to be the best person in the country. If the president understands their job Got is to it. check the other branches and to compete for power. That's the setup, right? And what Madison's also saying is, look, some of these older ideas, we talk about Montesquieu and the Enlightenment. And he says, yeah, they thought separation of powers was entire separation. My point in this constitution is that's checks and balances, right? Yes, we separate the branches but they're not entirely separated. They share power. And that's actually really important to Madison because he says complete separation actually leads to other problems. It doesn't work. We've tried it. Yeah, which what there are other, other philosophers that said yep. complete separation and he wanted yep, this exactly. overlap. Now, and, then why in, as we look at the next one, we look at consolidating power in with Federalist 70, consolidating power in the executive. What was the purpose around that? Yeah, so um, the big idea here, right, is that um, uh, energy is what's needed in the executive branch, right? So I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, Hamilton is- This is Hamilton now, not Madison. Yeah, Yeah. so one thing to keep in mind is when you're thinking about who wrote what, Madison tends to write the political theory stuff, Mm. the big picture stuff. Hamilton tends to address some of the more particular concerns. He writes about the president, about the judiciary, about the courts, the military, taxes. That's what Hamilton's writing about. And he thinks what you need in government is energy and dispatch. And he said, he thinks that the executive in particular needs to have this. There had been members at the convention who wanted a plural executive. They wanted a council. They wanted multiple people. They didn't want a single president. And what Hamilton is saying is that was a bad idea. Because for one, just kind of like what Madison said is we've tried that. Some states tried that. And Hamilton says that didn't work. And we had Congress doing this under the articles. There wasn't really an executive. That didn't work. What you need is somebody who has the energy and dispatch to carry out the commands and needs of the national government, but also who can take responsibility, right? Hamilton's saying both things. It's not just about the ability to do so, right? It's about taking responsibility as well, right? If you have a bunch of people, no one will take responsibility, then the people don't know who to look to. They don't know who to make responsible. They don't know who to put the duty upon. And Hamilton is saying, having a single president fixes that problem. Um, And so he's really making the argument here for why having a single president is so important, right? And Hamilton is saying it's all about the fact that we need to have a limited national government, but one in which the powers it does have, it carries out 
with energy and dispatch, right? Might only have a certain set of powers, but it's really important it does it well. And the president is doing things like what? Negotiating treaties with other foreign heads of states. And Hamilton's saying, you can't have other people in on that. You need the president who can speak for the people and do that job and then bring it back to the people and say, here's the deal I made, I'm responsible. That's kind of his vision. And now when we talk about Hamilton's next one that we're gonna look at, it's really about the courts, right? Yes. And uh, right, so I said here, he also talks about the judiciary. And I'll note one other thing, right, is that what Hamilton is saying here, this whole big theory is, it's not just about energy and responsibility. It's um, the sense that if government acts that way, it will better protect individual liberty than a bill of rights. That's previewing what we're gonna come to. That's exactly why Hamilton doesn't think one's necessary, right? Because the judiciary, he says, is the weakest branch, right? Congress makes the laws, they have a lot of power and the president carries them out, makes treaties, does these other things. He thinks it's clear that the judiciary and the Supreme Court are the weakest branch, but he also thinks they have this really important job. And keep in mind, right, this is before the Bill of Rights. So Hamilton isn't writing about like the Supreme Court needs to protect the following list of rights. He's saying rights generally, right? And to say, not just talking about rights, don't think of it that way, but think about overstepping boundaries and powers, right? The whole point is the constitution is supposed to be a set of limited but strong powers of the national government. And that Hamilton is saying one of the ways to preserve that, which I think connects to Madison as well, is to have an independent judiciary that can do so, right? So he, first off, he's saying independence is key. Supreme Court members are appointed for life. And they cannot be interfered with, right? They cannot be fired. They cannot be pressured, except for um, if they're impeached, right? They can be impeached. So yeah, they can be removed for certain behavior, but it's really hard to do so. We've had one impeachment of a Supreme Court justice. That was in 1805. And it was mostly because Thomas Jefferson wanted to get rid of um, a Federalist uh, justice who spoke up publicly against him. Who had a drinking problem so <laughs> so we won't talk we'll talk about that next class yeah yeah but so one the, of the, the key things- quote here is that hamilton says right you know so the courts don't have force or will but they have judgment but judgment is important right because any acts contrary to the constitution have to be void that is they have to not have power because the constitution is fundamental law because the people themselves ratify it and so yeah. i think it's important to see right is that that job of judicial review of reviewing acts of Congress or the president is a way of also maintaining popular sovereignty in the mind of him. Yeah. So, okay. So we're almost done with the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. And you pointed this out earlier. There's only yeah. one Anti-Federalist. It's Brutus, yes. Brutus number one. There's other ones to read. So we want to encourage yeah. you. But we have like three minutes left. So real quick. Yeah, so we have to run through one, What is the point? Why, it's, why is it in here? What should the students know about it? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we have Brutus here to kind of be representative of the anti-federalist persuasion. And I think the big takeaway here is that Brutus is saying, I don't, I'm not convinced by Madison. He's saying Federalist 10 isn't convincing because what Brutus and other anti-federalists think is that a large republic isn't better. What they think is that Manasu going back to the ancient Romans and the Greeks, to Plato, et cetera, they were right and that only smaller republics can truly survive and protect the rights and liberties of the people um, and can be truly democratic and Republican. Uh, so they're, they're skeptical of Madison's argument. And what they also think is um, not only will this not be Republic, but Republican, but it will also lead to arbitrary despotic government. The, the, the fear here is there will be a tendency towards tyranny and what they call consolidation, which is to say, taking more and more power from the states and the people and building a stronger national government over time. And that particular branches would work together to do this, right? Their fear was the Senate and the president will work together that actually sharing powers is bad, that we need more separation of powers because they're gonna be a cabal basically, or a kind of an aristocracy that are gonna work together that the, the Supreme Court will also want to protect unconstitutional acts to keep their own power. 
right? So they, in other words, the whole point here is they're listening to all those things we just talked about in the federal papers and they're saying, no, I'm not persuaded. Yeah. I actually think the way we did things was better than what we have here. So, and this leads us to this great question by Vance about what, what was the catalyst for the Bill of Rights? So if we think about the, the uh, constitution is given back to the states for ratification, the dissenters say, no, this isn't right, this isn't done. Then the writings of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists blow up the scene. Imagine America debating and discussion, should we take it, should we not? That's all the catalyst for actually doing a Bill of Rights. So I would almost give the Anti-Federalists cred for, um, I wouldn't say actually, I do give the anti federalists cred for their actions make the Bill of Rights happen. And then what's in the Bill of Rights? What are the essential pieces of the Bill of Rights? And we have one more document after this. So real quick, Bill of yeah, Rights. Um, you know, it's ironic for the anti federals because they get the Bill of Rights, but then it doesn't include the things they want. <laughs> um, so it's what we would call a Pyrrhic vic victory. Um, so they're very disappointed with that, right? Uh, but what are they demanding is actually what they really want is a limitation on federal power. They want to spell out clear limitations. Yes, they what want to they protect get? individual <laughs> liberties, but they really want to be clear that it isn't just about protecting those liberties, because what they really think is that states do a better job of protecting individual rights because they're closer to the people. They think that's the state's job because citizenship starts at the state level. Would you so, then say that like uh, the Tenth Amendment is was probably closer to what they wanted. It was closer, but even there, anti-federalists in Congress had argued for stronger language and lost the argument. They wanted to be clear that the 10th Amendment needed to specifically spell out that, that the federal government had limited enumerated powers. They wanted that in the document. Um, so that's what they were kind of fighting about. What Madison, Madison initially doesn't want a Bill of Rights, but the, the federalists are like, well, no, the structural constitution is the Bill of Rights. That's what protects against doing other things. We shouldn't just list rights, but Madison is convinced for a variety of reasons, some of political, some otherwise, to, to give into a Bill of Rights, in part because he can control it, right? So what Madison does is he proposes a set that is more about particular, uh, particular individual liberties that are protected, right? And sets of rights that we're familiar with in the Bill of Rights. So that is... In some sense, uh, yeah, the anti-federalists called for a Bill of Rights. Uh, some of those conventions I mentioned that were very close, they actually gave lists of rights that needed to be protected. Um, and that's how we got there. But um, and it was now, I think Madison himself who wrote it. But should we a move A perfect on? segue for somebody yeah. calling for rights and calling for freedoms and liberties. Then we segue to Martin Luther King and the the most modern document in this AP document series is a letter from the Birmingham jail, which I find that when, when King writes this and who he's speaking to changes the civil rights movement and flips it, really energizes it in a way that I don't think anybody telling him or him thinking about doing this had an understanding that it was gonna be this powerful. So tell us a little bit about this letter, who is it written to and kind of what energy it puts behind the civil rights movement. Yeah, so I, King wrote this from jail. He was in jail for a small period of time because he had actually, um, I think he had ignored a court order uh, in the South during a demonstration. Um, they were, and that's the thing about the civil rights movement, they were constantly fighting in the courts for their uh, ability to protest in the public and to be protected in exercising their First Amendment freedoms. And so this was, this was one of those many cases. And uh, King is kind of uh, addressing the big themes, right? So for one, he's writing to people who aren't part of the movement, trying to get them to support their cause, right? He's and it's other religious leaders, right? He's yes, writing, yeah, yeah he's, he's saying, sure. you, you are people that believe in the, the sanctity of the individual, you better right. get on my side and help me. I love it. It's such a call to action. He's saying, they're saying they have questions. Why the strategy? Why do what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And so King is answering that and he's doing so uh, both at the smaller level, but also in terms of using these old uh, founding documents we've just talked about. So, uh, you know, what King says is, look, I mean, injustice anywhere is a threat 
to justice everywhere, right? We're caught in this, this struggle. And the best way to do this, he thought, was nonviolent direct action because he thought it brought about what he called constructive tension. In other words, he thought tension was necessary for negotiation in order to get the outcome they wanted. In other words, King thought that there was a series of things that had to happen to get through the outcome they wanted. So in other words, they had to carry a confrontation, but on a nonviolent level in order to achieve the ends of justice that they were desiring in terms of equal liberty and rights. That's where the founding documents come in, right? Is what am I talking about, right? King is saying, I'm invoking American tradition. I'm invoking Jefferson and I'm invoking Henry David Thoreau, right? For one, he's saying, look, I mean, Thoreau created civil disobedience and it goes back to St. Augustine and, and other uh, Christian heroes, right? He's a, as Curry said, he's addressing religious leaders and saying, look, I mean, uh, unjust, immoral laws that, that are unconscionable, right? You can break that law, right? Because you can't ask an individual to submit to a law that his conscience tells them is unjust. Otherwise, we would think that Nazi Germany and segregation were okay, right? Um, and he doesn't, and part of this is to say, look, I mean, the civil rights movement isn't extreme, but moderate, right? We're nonviolent. And we can look back to, as I said, Jefferson, but also Abraham Lincoln in the sense that um, these are the promises that are made to us throughout history, right? And he has this passage he loves to invoke about the Declaration of Independence being uh, a promissory note, right? Which is to say is our founding creed is that all men are created equal. We are simply trying to live up to that. That is a moderate position in King's mind. And that's exactly what he's trying to say is you should get on board because what we're doing here is very much part of our constitutional vision. Awesome. That's unbelievable. I think it, I love how this begins with a declaration and then a call to us again to the declaration. Um, and we had Judge McKee a few weeks ago that told us, you know, we look at the declaration and we see these big ideas and these big values, our principles spelled out in there. And then we as citizens have to ensure that our laws are, are aligned with those principles. You hope that they would be, but when they're not, it takes citizens to change and in all different ways, in court cases, in running for office, in protesting and getting arrested, all different ways. So I think it's a fantastic way to loop up those two together. Students, it's, if it's you are ideal, taking, right? yeah, ideals so, and action, which is almost how you described Madison and Hamilton too. One was ideals and one was action, <laughs> um, at least yeah. in the Federalist papers. And ones that when they're made in the 18th century are very new to the world. Now we said the declaration were ideas popping up, but they were new ideas. Yeah, And so absolutely. it's trying to live up to pretty high new universal ideas over time. And that's that struggle, right? Is if you set your, your aim high, then you have to do the work to get there. Nice, think of I like kind that. Of that. I like thinking too. about it like that, Nicholas. Nicholas, thank you so much. This was a great class. Students, if you are taking the AP exam, we wish you the best of luck. We'll be channeling we'll you. We'll come back in an hour and we'll do this again. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do this at two o'clock as well if you need another refresh. If you're not, this was awesome exposure and thank you for joining us. Um, great questions, great shares in the chat. And we are here if you need us. Remember, we can, if you need us and you get stuck, you can email us. We're here to help gang and you're gonna do great. Thank you all very much. And with that, I will stop the recording.